Hey guys, Dr. Justin Marcajani here. Today we're gonna be doing a video on why you're having a hard time losing belly fat. We're gonna dive in and look at the underlying physiology and biochemistry and what's happening under the hood and what you can do about it. Before we do, please smash the like button. Really helps the search algorithm. Love to see your comments uh, down below as well. So why are you having a hard time losing belly fat? Well, when you look under the hood, there's different hormones that are essentially partitioning and telling, like air traffic controllers, telling the body where to send that fuel, whether we send it to the muscle and the mitochondria to burn it up, or whether we send it to the fat cells to store it. Hormones play a major role in the type of foods you eat elicit different hormonal responses, right? When you eat protein, for instance, maybe you get more of a glucagon response, you get more satiation signals when you consume more fructose, especially high fructose corn syrup, that's gonna send a signal of storing that glucose more in the liver over the muscles. And then of course, converting any extra space in that liver to fat first, which can create systemic insulin resistance. And then we have starchy foods, right, which are gonna be more glucose based. Those will go more to the muscle. We have a bigger reservoir to handle glucose over fructose. And so this is really important, of course, fat plays a big role too. You don't quite get the insulinogenic stimulation of fat. Fat's very satiating. So when you're eating good, healthy, whole food fats, it's hard to over eat good fats because it just makes you full, right? It's the reason why you see, you know, you'll go back to your college days or like your commercials of the 90s, like, you know, once you pop, you can't stop, right? It's the Pringles, it's the pizza. It's the processed food that misses that satiation signal or comes very late. It's very hard to overeat steak or overeat eggs but because you get that feeling of satiation, it's full on your stomach. It's gonna create signals like peptide YY, adiponectin, cholecystokinin, too much of it will make you feel nauseous. Super common, it's, it's easy to pound a whole bunch of chips and pizza, right? Everyone has that experience, or even soda, for instance. All right, so let me just kind of dive into a couple things here out of the gate. So why are you having a hard time? First thing is systemic insulin resistance. So I talked about glucose and fructose and how they get metabolized. And by the way, it is pronounced fructose, not fructose, but fructose. Okay, I've looked this up a couple of times. I get some comments down below. So fructose um, it is how it gets metabolized. So your typical high fructose corn syrup, like your, your sugar that you see like in your soda, it's typically at 55, 45, right? Fructose on the bigger side, 55 side, glucose on the 45 side. And your typical table sugar is sucrose, which is about 50, 50, 50% fructose, 50% glucose. So when we talk about high fructose corn syrup, it's slightly more um, on the fructose side. And again, there's no fiber there. And so when you're dealing with fructose from processed sugar versus fruit, it's totally different because you have the fiber. So unbound fructose um, is gonna be way different than bound fructose, i.e. like berries with fiber and pectin and vitamin C and nutrients. Totally different, right? Your high fructose corn syrup has no nutrients, no fiber. And then your um, berries have the opposite. They have the fiber, they have all the vitamin C and the bioflavonoids, and they're, they're not quite as glycating as well or um, insulin resistant. So your body has to take that fructose when it comes in and the primary source is gonna go is the liver. The liver is a much smaller reservoir than the muscles for storage. Muscles can hold anywhere between 250 to 300 grams of carbohydrate, of, of glucose, and then usually it's about 60 to 80 or so in the liver. These are rough estimates based on how big you are, right? So just rough estimates. So you're looking at anywhere about five times more storage in the muscle than the liver. Why does this matter? Because we're con if we're consuming lots of processed food, you're getting more fructose than you are glucose. So you're stressing out the smaller res reservoir. Once that liver starts to get fatty because you're stuffing it with glycogen, now it's starting to stuff it with um, fatty acids. It's converting that fructose into palmitic acid. So now it's a fatty liver. You'll see it on a um, ultrasound. We can run tests here to actually look at it. You can run ALT, ALT greater than 25, that's alanine transferase, or even AST as well. You're gonna see enzymes that are elevated that show that, that liver is, is degrading. So the fatty acids being deposited there is creating stress in the liver. So you can see ALT 25 or above is problematic. Again, these numbers over the years have gone up because as the population gets sicker, essentially normal range is two standard deviations. So as that population gets sicker, the, the two standard deviations to the left and right get wider. So now your 50 or so is the range, is the high range on the ALT. So that's problematic. So you can run ALT, you can run liver enzymes to look and see fatty liver. This is important. Fasting insulin is one of the most underused markers. It's so important. It gives you a good window into insulin resistance. Because what happens is as your body needs to stimulate, it has more glucose in the bloodstream and even fructose. Now, fructose 
it's weird. It does not necessarily stimulate an insulin response. That's why people can say I can have fruit and maybe not like bump up my blood sugar as much. But the problem is it gets deposited in the liver and it can create systemic insulin resistance. Fatty liver can create systemic insulin resistance. So that your body now needs to make more insulin to to stick more of that fructose in there. And so even though you don't get a direct insulin response like you do with glucose, like a starch, it's still going to create systemic insulin resistance because it has to go into that liver. And so that fatty liver is going to drive insulin resistance. It's very insulinogenic. So very important to look on that. May not be a direct thing, but it's more indirect. The results the same. So you can run a fasting insulin. If we see a fasting insulin above 10, that's definitely problematic. Definitely below 7. In Christopher Gardner's study, A to Z, back in Stanford for 2007, he found patients that had greater than 7 needed or did better on a low-carb diet. People that were 7 or below 7, they could do high-carb, they could low-carb, they could be more metabolically flexible. So when you have people that are like, oh, I can do high-carb, I can do this, it's like, well, you probably have lower insulin, you're probably more insulin-sensitive. When you're insulin-sensitive, you can kind of pinch hit, you can do a lot. doesn't mean the average person is, and so it's good to individualize your recommendations and know why you're individualizing it. High levels of fasting insulin, insulin resistance, and again, you can combine that with your liver enzymes, your ALT. You can always order an ultrasound as well. Now, high triglycerides, that's a big one. We want to be below 100. My goal ratio is 2 to 1, trig to HDL, 2 to 1. Ideally, closer to one to one. Like my numbers right now for me, I'm like a 60 and 60. I'm a 60 on the trig, 60 on the HDL. So I'm a one to one ratio. That's like ideal textbook, right? You want to be two to one. So if you're at 100 on the trigs, we want to be 50 on the HDL. So at least that ratio or less. All right, closer to one to one's ideal. That tells me that you're getting more insulin resistance. This is a big deal, right? And again, trigs, statins don't touch trigs. A lot of the medications won't touch it. You, it's, it's fish oils, it's niacin, it's, it's cutting carbohydrates and restricting sugar and processed food and inflammation. Functional glucose tolerance test is another excellent test. This is kind of my invention from other people talking about it and doing different things. I've been doing it for over a decade. You have your typical glucose tolerance test. They give you a 75 gram solution. You drink it, you measure your glucose at fasting along with insulin, and then they'll do a one, two hour, three hour or so, or anywhere between typically you know, an hour to two hours. They do this in pregnancy as well to look for gestational diabetes. And they'll typically run glucose and insulin along with it. It's hard to run insulin at home, so we just get like our handy-dandy like blood sugar meter. Here's the uh, Keto Mojo. This is a good one because it measures ketones as well, and it's pretty cost-effective. It also graphs um, the blood sugar as well. You can hook it up to your phone, Bluetooth it, or an online website, and it will look at it. So this is a wonderful meter. Test our fasting. Do a one-hour, two-hour, three-hour after the meal. Typically, you're going to cast you're going to catch insulin resistance out of the gate because if you have a lot of insulin coming out, typically that blood sugar is going to go up just a little bit faster than that insulin can come out of the pancreas, out of those beta cells. So usually you'll catch insulin in that first hour. It's like the blood sugar will come up and the insulin comes up to bring it right back down, right? So usually you'll catch it in that first hour, that surge, you know, greater than 140 or so. That's how you know you're starting to surge. And typically, you know, one, two hours, we want to be black, back below 120 to 100. And then hour three, we want to be back below 100. So typically 140 to 120 or below hour one, 120 to 100 or below hour two, definitely below 100 hour three. So this is a good way to look at it to make sure you're on track. And typically you'll see insulin resistance in that first hour. Now I'll run a fasting insulin blood test. So we'll go and look at it and see where you're at. Like mine's on the cusp. I'm like nine or 10. So I try to be walking right now. My Fitbit on right here. I'll put it on my, my uh, legs. If I'm doing more biking and pedaling, cause if I'm not moving, right, the Fitbit won't grab it because it's got a GPS on it. I'll have my air bike over there. I'll do my rower. I'll do some resistance training. So I got to be active because I'm more prone to put on weight because I'm more insulin resistant. So if I'm less active, and if I am eating too much carbs, I got problems. So that's, that's kind of not where I'm at. And it's good to get your labs looked at so you know then you can make changes with your diet and lifestyle to, to be on top of these things. So your fu functional glucose tolerance is good. ALT is really good for that fatty liver assessment outside of an ultrasound. Ultrasound is the gold standard. T-peptide, another good marker to know how much insulin you're pumping out. So you have insulin, it's typically bound to this peptide hormone, then it gets broken off and then it can be used. And so you're measuring that T-peptide to look at the overall output. Again, if you're chronically diabetic, chronically type two, eventually you'll go to type one. And so we'll run T-peptide to see if someone's going into type one, just pancreatic fatigue. It's not type one autoimmune, but it's type one just through a fatigue, if you will, of damaging those cells over decades and decades. 
Now, uric acid's powerful because uric acid is a metabolic byproduct of fructose. Now, it's also a byproduct of meat. Again, you're going to see, you know, you'll hear stories of gout and things like that. Again, the xanthine oxidase enzyme that helps metabolize the purines from protein does not get inhibited with typical good, clean protein animal sources. It's usually the proteins with lots of wine, lots of sugar, lots of processed food. That's the enzyme that breaks up uric acid. So you're going to get a lot more uric acid elevations that are problematic with the high levels of fructose. And that fructose decreases the ENOS enzyme, endothelial synthase, which is an enzyme that opens up the vasculature that allows good blood flow. This is the reason why you will see increase in blood pressure because you're decreasing the vasodilation. It's also causing you to hold on to sodium a lot more, which holds on to more fluid. More fluid is going to increase pressure in the vasculature. This is why you'll see high levels of blood pressure. So it's important to look at. But say, oh, salt's so bad. Well, it's like, well, why is the salt high? Why are you holding on to the salt? It's the insulin resistance and the inflammation that's driving that. Plus, when you have high levels of inflammation, guess what also happens? You're surging cortisol. What does cortisol do, right? It's a glucocorticoid. So it's going to stimulate more glucose because part of the stress response is to have glucose nearby so you can burn it so you can run, fight, or flee. But if you're insulin resistant, that's a problem. At least prehistorically, you just run and you'd burn up that glucose. Well, now, guess what? That glucose is not getting burnt up. Now, this is important because uric acid, number three, uric acid damages carnitine palmitto transferase. This is important. Let me show you this. Uh, this is important here. So this is called the carnitine shuttle. So you have acetyl-CoA, right? Acetyl-CoA, when you look at like the Krebs cycle, um, it, you have protein, fats, and carbs, right? Carbs go through gly glycolysis, but everything shuttles down and becomes acetyl-CoA. Acetyl-CoA dumps into the electron transport chain, pumps around. Each time it pumps around, it pumps around an NADH and an FADH2. It does that two times, so you get about six NADHs, two FADH2s. That pumps an electron transport chain, generates another 33, 34 ATP, and that's how you, you have energy. That's how your mitochondria works. Now, there's what's called the carnitine shuttle, where you have acetyl-CoA here from that first part, this is called beta oxidation, okay? And that carnitine, then you have acetylcarnitine or L-carnitine. This is an important amino acid made from methionine and lysine, and it requires this enzyme called CPT1. CPT1 is carnitine palmetto transferase one. That enzyme helps the, the fat, carnitine essentially shuttling carnitine into the mitochondria. So we're on the outside of the mitochondria over here, outside here, now we're in. And to get in, it requires the carnitine shuttle. Carnitine shuttle then requires the enzyme CPT1 to make that happen. High levels of uric acid, guess what? It damages that enzyme and it prevents it from dumping that fatty acid into the mitochondria. You'll also find that you can't even get those free fatty acids broken down without the hormone sensitive lipase enzyme. And that enzyme gets knocked down when you have high levels of insulin. So the more insulin resistant you are, you knock down hormone sensitive lipase. And then you're also going to stimulate uric acid because now you're insulinogenic. That's going to stimulate and block that CPT1 enzyme, carnitine palmetto transferase 1, which is going to decrease the carnitine shuttle, which means you're not going to be able to engage in healthy beta fatty acid oxidation and burn fat for fuel. So this is powerful. It's good to look kind of what's happening under the hood. And then, or what's the intervention? How do we fix this? Now, movement helps because movement squeezes the muscles, which then basically your kid spills Cheerios, spills their drink. You wipe it up. Now you have this dry cloth is now absorbed. It's fully absorbed, right? My second kid spills it. If I use the first sponge to wipe up the second kid's mess, I just push it around, right? Because you lose the absorption. So when you wring out that, that cloth, that microfiber, it's like using your muscles. Now you have a bigger reservoir for glucose that comes in. So now you're less um, insulin resistant because you have a space to put the glucose, right? You become insulin resistant when you don't have a space to put that glucose. Insulin shuttling glucose in, if there's not a space for it, guess what? You become insulin resistant. Just like that sponge, you wring it out so you can clean up your second kid's mess. It's the same thing. And so by exercise, even just walking, you're burning some of that glucose in the muscle. You're burning some fat too. Maybe you do some push-ups, some resistance training. Now you're increasing those GLUT4 receptor sites. That's pulling glucose or and in some fructose in. Um, that's hypertrophying your muscles too. So now you have bigger muscle. It's like upgrading that microfiber from the 12 inch to the 24. Now you have a bigger, you know, um, microfiber to clean up your kid's mess. Woohoo! And then, of course, um, you know, we're, we're doing other things as well, such as, you know, maybe nutrients, maybe adding more magnesium, maybe more B vitamins, maybe we're adding more carnitine. So this is a cool study. This looks at the possible role of using carnitine 
to help with the hepatic changes of hyperuricemia. Well, why? Because guess what? Uric acid decreases that CPT1 enzyme. So if we can add that carnitine, you know, in there in a way that we can we can essentially knock down that uric acid level through supplemental carnitine. Now, I would say you also want to get your diet dialed in and decrease the insulin because that's kind of the root cause. If the insulin's driving the uric acid, we don't want to rely just on supplementation. We want to, hey, get the insulin down, get your diet down, get the inflammation down, and then maybe add these supplements in. Also, quality of food matters because I could be, you know, eating lower carb soy and, and processed fatty acids and omega-6. And guess what? I guarantee you the inflammation is playing a role because glucocorticoids are going to be stimulated when you have inflammation. Glucocorticoids mobilize glucose. Glucose is going to then stimulate more insulin. So you can see how inflammation does play in as well. Again, you know, the sugar slash fruit. When I say sugar, that's my colloquial term for sucrose, high fructose. And then our starch are going to typically be glucose. Glucose is still intermogenic, but at least you have a better reservoir and a mechanism to deal with glucose. That's the big thing. And so hope that helps, guys. And there's a lot of stuff here I just kind of went over. I hope it makes sense and you guys find some value in it. If you do, please let me know. I'm going to just knock some of this stuff down. So why, what does insulin do to fat burnings? We talked about uric acid. We talked about carnitine. So if you guys have any questions about this, put it in the comments down below. Love to see it. If you're having chronic insulin issues, you want to dive in and you want to see what's happening metabolically under the hood. Am I having problems? You know, also other hormones play a role. Testosterone plays a role. Thyroid hormone plays a role, right? Increase, the higher your thyroid hormone is, the easier it is to deal with carbohydrates and glucose because your metabolic fire is running hotter. It's like having a hotter furnace. You're going to have a bigger electric bill. You're going to burn up that extra glucose because your metabolic fire is burning hotter. So looking at thyroid, uh, female hormones play a role too, especially if you have lower progesterone that can increase and or low estrogen too, that can increase insulin resistance too. So if you have these diet things and these hormone things, that can also play a big role. And then of course the gut plays a role because if you have a lot of inflammation there, inflammation can then throw off these uh, hormones and blood sugar as well. Hope you guys enjoyed today's video. If you did, let me know down below. And if you want to dive in deeper, you want more help on the functional medicine side, provide that support worldwide. Again, links down below if you want to reach out and schedule, guys. All right, have a phenomenal day. Take care, y'all. Bye.